I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. Today's episode is sponsored by Poets and Writers, which is the absolutely essential go-to resource for creative writers. Founded in 1970, Poets and Writers is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Visit pw.org to get inspired, connect with others, and explore a treasure trove of trustworthy information about writing contests, literary agents, and more. I'm here today with Megan Alexander, who's an Emmy-nominated national news correspondent on Inside Edition, the number one syndicated news magazine TV show. She has covered football for CBS, acted in the TV show Nashville, appeared in several films, and executive produced the feature film Heartbeats. She is the author of Faith in the Spotlight, Thriving in Your Career While Staying True to Your Beliefs, and a new children's book, One More Hug, illustrated by Hiro Nakata. She also hosts the podcast Inspired with Megan Alexander and co-hosts the sports podcast Women Talk Sport. She hosts the Inspirational Country Music Awards each year from Nashville, Tennessee, and currently splits her time between New York and Nashville. So welcome, Megan. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. Of course. What a pleasure. Your children's book, One More Hug, I have to say, my kids now request over and over again, and I am not just saying that. They love it. And every time I read it out loud, I start crying. (laughs) Thank you. That's the ultimate compliment. Thank you. (laughs) And I do too. I'm crying too still. (laughs) So why don't you tell listeners what One More Hug is about? Yeah. So when I was thinking about writing a second book, my first book was about faith and more of a guidebook for young adults. And when I was thinking about my second book, I got some great advice. Write what you know, what's going on in your life right now. And I started talking about my son, who at the time was in kindergarten and was having a lot of anxiety getting on the school bus. And he kept running back to me for one more hug, one more, one more hug. And he must have asked me for five or six hugs. And what started as being first in line to get on the bus, by the time he was done running back for all those hugs, he was the last little boy to get on the school bus. And this went on for almost two years, kindergarten, first grade. And at first, my husband, Brian, and I were sort of hurrying him along, like, come on, time to go to school. Let's go. You know, quick little hugs and then sort of pushing him on his way. And then we realized, oh, my gosh, we need to slow down and cherish these moments and just be there for him. And it became a little saying in our family where when he'll ask for one more hug, we'll say, there's always time for one more hug. And that happens at bedtime. That happens when mommy needs to travel for work. And that's how the book came about. I was telling my editor that story, and she said, Megan, that is your next book. One more hug. She said, you need to write about that. And so in the book, we take the boy not just through childhood, but also into high school. And then when he's going off supposedly to college, you can always come back for one more hug. Aww. <laughs> well, I'm glad. And he still asked for hugs. So. Yes, I know. That was so nice. <laughs> I had, my son was literally like walking out the door today and my husband was like, aren't you going to like give your mom a hug? And he's like, oh yeah, right, right. You know, and I'm like, really? Now you have this whole beautiful book and like I can barely get my kid to turn around. But anyway. <laughs> You're like, come here, give me that hug. <laughs> <laughs> so I found it interesting in the book, you actually cited the study from Child Trends, a leading nonprofit research organization, saying that children receive lifelong positive outcomes when their parents express warmth and affection to them. So this seems like an obvious point, right? The more you're nice to your kids, the better off they'll probably be most most of the time. And yet, is there always time for one more hug in the craziness of day-to-day life? It seems like there have been many times where I'm like, like you used to be, like getting people, okay, okay, enough snuggling. Now it's bedtime. So how do you know when to draw the line? When do you stop your hugs? Like, do you have a hard stop at five or six or... You know, that's a really good question. And honestly, I don't think I can ask that question. <laughs> Literally for Chase, my son, on whom this book is based, it was about five. Mm-hmm. And then he was good. He would literally run back for about five hugs. And then at bedtime, both Chase and now my younger son, Catcher, probably call out for two or three one more hugs. I, I think by four or five, my tone <laughs> is a bit more, okay, okay, time time to settle down now. You know, time to turn off the lights. But Honestly, for me, I I try to just put down my phone and appreciate that moment. And as a working woman, I got to say, I wasn't always that way. I mean, I absolutely hurry my kids along at times. And it was really a realization of this isn't going to last forever. Because I'm a young mom. I have an eight-year-old, I have a four-year-old, and now I have a baby. And so 
you know, all the, I'm seeing it go by like that, even just with my eight year old. And I'm getting really sentimental. And I think as a reporter, you know, you got to, you try to figure out the who, what, where, when, why. And I want to be the best mom I can be. And I have a lot of fear as a mother. I mean, I've had this conversation with my husband and friends numerous times where I feel comfortable interviewing celebrities, CEOs, top newsmakers. I get very scared when my sweet little boys look up at me and ask me a question I don't know the answer <laughs> to. I'm really worried about being a good mom. And so in this season, it's just been slowing down and going, maybe it's just a hug right now. I don't have to have all the answers, even though I want them. I want to do the best that I can. It's been slowing down to just give those hugs because I'm trying to just give them what they need in the moment. And yet you're already giving them what they need without even trying. Oh, I hope so. No, it's true. I, I mean, so. <laughs> not to say like, I know so much more because I have 12 year olds, you know, what do I know? But the stuff that the kids really need is not the stuff that will come out of your mouth maybe one day and not the yeah. next. It's just like that that sense of like you loving them and no matter how busy you are, like you're going to give it to them, you know? Oh, I hope so. Well, and you brought up a good point with the research. With our little boys, you do yes. see, I mean, I, I come from a family of girls. My mom is one of three girls. I have an older sister. And so having boys, you know, you you start to notice that media and culture and society wants them to dry their tears quicker than I kind of thought would happen with mm-hmm. sports and with, with activities and, you know, be tough, suck it up. You can and call I, it this like the shake it off. The syndrome. shake it <laughs> off, absolutely. And I found myself going, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't want him to stop expressing his feelings. I think there's a way we can teach our boys to still be tough and yet express that need for affection and love because ultimately doesn't that make the best husbands and fathers if our guys can still express their emotions and just everything going on in the world today and wanting our boys to still feel like it's okay to show those tender, the tender side of them. So that's kind of been going through my mind too is, oh gosh, I want I want my eight-year-old to know as he's, you know, beginning to kind of look around the playground and see that boys are supposed to, you know, toughen up a little more. Like, it's okay to still share your feelings. That's, again, a season that we're in right now and where my heart was when I wrote this book is I want them to know it's always okay to come back for a hug. And you wrote a song to accompany the book also. Yes. And I can't believe, so you play the guitar at bedtime? That's amazing. Well, I'm very basic. I just know your basic chords. And I quickly learned growing up when I took guitar lessons that like all the Beatles songs are four chords. Like you can play a lot of music by just knowing your basic chords on guitar. But yeah, once we put together the book and the manuscript is ready to go, my literal, literally my next phone call was to my friend Michael Oakes, who I worked for 15 years ago in Nashville. He's an incredible singer-songwriter. One of my first jobs, I called him. He's We've stayed good friends. And then I called my friend Lucas Hogue, who's a country singer in Nashville and also a great songwriter. And I said, we have to write a song that goes along with this book. Just the emotions and let's do a sweet children's lullaby. And so, yeah, we put it to music and put together a music video. And my son has a little part in it. Both of my kids are in it. And we just try to express this story of One More Hug in a musical way. Just one more way to express, you know, what we want to give our kids. Yeah, why not? I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you have the skill, that's amazing. Yeah, and music's a part of our routine too. You know, bedtime, like like you mentioned, I play the guitar for my boys and sing to them. That's a way for me to connect with them. So it was just kind of a logical thing to do to accompany the book. When I first read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I barely know my own name by bedtime. The fact that you're like <laughs> whipping out the guitar and like composing music, I was like blown over. Well, some people tell creative stories to their kids. Some people, you know, for me, it was just, let's pick up the guitar and start singing. I think everybody has something. Yeah. Okay. You know? I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Everybody has something. Some parents tell jokes. Yep. Like everybody has a little something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and go back a little bit to your first book. So how did the idea for that come book come about and what's like the main what the main takeaways from that book for people who haven't read it yeah so that book is called faith in the spotlight thriving in your career while staying true to your beliefs and i've been in the entertainment industry now for about 15 years and i got an email a couple of years ago from a pastor in seattle bothell united methodist church i was born and raised in seattle and a pastor emailed me and said, I have a church full of young, ambitious women of faith. They want to go after their goals and dreams, get that corner office, climb the corporate ladder, maybe work in entertainment, but they don't want to sell their soul to get there. And they look at pop culture and they just think, I don't want to do all that. Is there a way to still achieve while maintaining 
my faith in values, how I was raised. And he said, I, I know of you. I don't know of that many people in the entertainment industry that have maintained their faith. He said, would you come speak to these girls? And I'd gotten that email before, and I felt like it was just yesterday I was that girl sitting in church with big dreams, wondering how it was all going to play out. And so that that got me thinking, gosh, let's go to the bookstore and find a book I can refer to these young women. And I found a lot of good books for men on being a Christian businessman or bringing your faith into business for men. And then I found a lot of great books for being a mom or a wife with a faith-based, you know, set of guidelines, but very few for the young, working, ambitious female. And it was that light bulb moment where I thought, I need to write it. Like, there, I really don't see any books, and I'm looking for them myself. And so I sent out 10 book proposal letters. I got nine rejections and one yes from Simon & Schuster to write that book. So I said, anybody listening, if you want to write a book, all it takes is one yes. I, I could have been very discouraged after four, five, six. The ninth letter comes back and— they said no, and then you got. I got that tenth letter that was a yes. So hold out for one yes, everybody. That's all you need. You probably heard that from other authors too. I have, but it's, it never gets old. <laughs> yeah. So hang in there. And so the book came about, and it's been a way to just kind of give a set of guidelines and inspirational stories and advice and practical advice. I wanted it to be meaty. Let, let's really talk about body image, negotiating. What do you do if you find yourself in an uncomfortable situation? You know, I share the story when I was asked to wear a dress that I wasn't comfortable wearing on national television, or maybe you're on set for a movie and they want to push the scene more than you're comfortable with, what are you going to do? And so it's not just me. It's a lot of people I know in the industry. What, I, what do you do? Well, I, I said no to that film. That was an independent film a couple years ago. It was the final scene, and it was a love scene. And the script called for just a romantic close hug. And we were on set, and the director said, he said, cut. And he came over, and he said, let's just do a little bit more. Let's do this. Let's do that. And he really started pushing it beyond what I was comfortable doing. And everybody's staring at you. What do you do? I never discussed that in college. I never went over that with my acting coaches or teachers. It was more technique. And so I got uncomfortable and I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't think so. I really like what's in the script. And he kind of looked at me and he went, okay. And we ended up being fine and the movie was filmed that way. So that's a positive instance. But I, you know, there was another time where I had to just turn down a role and they said, okay. And, and they just gave it to somebody else because I wasn't comfortable. So I tell young people, Try to know who you are before you get into this industry. Parents, try to run those scenarios with your kids. What would you do if this happened or that happened? How would you decide? What would be your response? Because I talked about very little of that when I was studying to be in this industry. And I think we got to talk about it and give examples. And everybody's comfort level is different. You know, mine is different than this girl or that girl. So just find out what works for you. Right, but everybody has one. So I guess everybody has being one. Being aware of what to do in that spot. I mean, yes. that took a lot of courage to be able to say, look, no, I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, and, a lo- and a lot of people wouldn't have been able to say that. I was going to say, if it had happened 10 years ago, I don't think I would have had the courage. Mm-hmm. But it happened a couple years ago when I was already thinking about these sorts of things. So yeah, it's important to talk about it early, early, early. Talk about this stuff in junior high and high school. I mean, this is not just good for people of faith. I mean, I you know, I'm not Christian, but this is like a great book for my children. I mean, this is a yeah. book for anybody, right? Anybody t- who's just yeah. trying to adhere to any good values in life, right? Totally. What's your comfort level? What do you believe in? What are your black and whites? What will you not compromise on? Absolutely. Just knowing who you are and what you want to represent. When, when people see you, you know, I had Beyonce's vocal coach about a decade ago. I took a voice lesson with Beyonce's vocal coach in Nashville. Many, many years ago, I saved my pennies and I took one with her. She was super expensive, but she literally said to me, Megan, who are you in this industry? Who is Megan Alexander? And I said to her, well, I don't know. I was hoping you could help me. And she said, Megan, we can't tell you who you are. You need to decide. And if you don't, somebody else will decide for you. One day you'll wake up, look in the mirror and not be crazy about what you see. Awesome advice. And that applies to so many situations, just defining who you are. So could you answer that question now? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm somebody that I want my family to be proud of my work. I think about my father. I think about my grandfather, my friends, young women that I know now are watching me and reading my book. I want them to be proud of the work that I 
do, whether it's in, you know, print form or on television. I like to do inspirational work, inspirational content. I like there to be some some redeeming factor to the art, right? <laughs> some story that's being told or a moral of the story. I think that's important, you know. So still trying to fine-tune it. Now as a mother, I'm aware of my my little boys, and soon my baby girl will be watching mommy. And what does that mean? You know, I want them to be proud of my work. And did your podcast come as an offshoot of this inspirational endeavor? Absolutely. So many inspirational stories I find get left on the cutting room floor in media because there's just not enough time for all of them. And so, yeah, I said, I've got to create an outlet where I can tell some of these stories and interview these people that are doing awesome things. So I just told you before we started here, I'm so grateful for podcasts and the opportunity to get this content on air. Anybody can do it and tell these stories. So true. So how often do you, tell me more about your podcast. How often do you record it? Like, how are you fitting all this into your life? I know that's like an annoying question. How do you do it all? But logistically, when you split your time, you're between Nashville and New York and you're doing this podcast and hosting. Well, I mean, you're doing like a zillion things. Well, the podcast is kind of on hiatus right okay, now. Okay, right. <laughs> Once I got pregnant uh, yeah. and I have a two, two and a half month old baby girl at the time that you and I are talking right now, I knew I needed to cut okay. back. It was just Good. a little too I'm much. Like, I'm happy to hear that. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> so I, I just tried to record a bunch and then have them in the can, you mm-hmm. know, and yeah. tried to put one out every other week. And maybe I'll start it up again some someday. I really enjoyed doing it. I mean, I love what you do. You're really good. I listened to books. your podcast. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and you actually, you mentioned in one of your podcasts with somebody, some hairdresser you had on the Upper West Side. Yeah. So I have to ask you also like who that is because that is not so far from here and yes. I love your hair. You're so kind. That is Cher. Shout out to Cher at Dramatics on the Upper no Side. No way. 72nd. Stop it. Dramatics. Yeah. No way. That's yes. Right. Yes. Okay. I just stumbled in once yeah, and that's said. that's so funny. It's been there out? forever. I, oh, that's yeah. why I'm joking about like when I was in high school. Oh, Dramatics is a chain that's all yeah. over Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So <laughs> so I'm still like going back to how you do everything aside from stealing your hairdresser. <laughs> Podcast is on hiatus. Do you yeah. have like a general framework? Like I'm only going to do this amount of work or are there things you turn down? Or, oh, yeah. I mean, there must be. Oh, but. absolutely. Well, I am part-time with Inside Edition now. I For the last couple of years, I only work for them a couple of days a week, mm-hmm. which is very helpful <laughs> with all this other stuff that's going on. But I get a lot of work done on the plane. Mm -hmm. So I commute from Nashville, Tennessee to New York City. I'm flying all the time. And, you know, it's a beautiful thing to have two hours of uninterrupted time. plane time. I will, like, stay on a plane for a week. I'm like, don't bother me. This is amazing. Yes. (laughs) So I wrote both of these books basically on the plane because all of a sudden, a lot of people are annoyed that you have to turn off your cell phone. I see it as a gift now. You know, yes, you can still get Wi-Fi and so forth. But, I mean, that— Uninterrupted time is huge, whether to read or to write. So a lot of it has been commuting or in the car in the city when you're going from one story to the other. I just try to be intentional with my time and take advantage of it. But traveling has ended up being a way for me to focus. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Do you feel like you let any balls drop? Like, is there anything that— Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't do it all. I've shared this with people before. I heard a lady say this once at a conference. She said— you can have it all, but you can't have it all perfectly. Mm-hmm. And that is so true. I mean, there have been times where a couple of years ago, I was covering Thursday Night Football for CBS, and I was in Denver covering a Broncos game. And I FaceTimed with my husband, who was taking Chase, my oldest son, to a flag football game that I was missing. And a lot of people would go, oh my gosh, an NFL game. You know, it's the Broncos. It's so exciting. But I was missing my sweet son's flag football game. And he was like, Mommy, where are you? So there are trade-offs, you know, where you've got to go, gosh, okay, I can't miss the next one. You know, and so then I'll say no to other assignments because I want to be there for my kiddos. My husband and I are constantly getting on our calendars and talking and saying, okay, what's going on here and next week and doing that juggle that so many people do. My parents are very involved. Grandparents are big in our life, which I'm so grateful for. They're very involved with the kids too. So if mommy can't be there, Nana can be there, which is wonderful. And then, yeah, you just, you know, you just have to turn things down sometimes. Like there's been a couple different speaking gigs that I've been asked to do where it was just one too many weekends away and you just need that time together. So we just try to, I do the old fashioned pros and cons lists, you know, okay, let's talk about this and 
what's going on there. And it's just, you know, it's a, it's a dance that do we you all feel do. Like, do you feel like you've been getting to a place where you're the one who might need the hug? Sure. And I will say, you know, it's harder as your kids get older. I'm sure you can relate to this. Like my eight-year-old needs me the most now of the eight-year-old, the four-year-old and the baby. Well, of course the baby needs me, but you know what I mean? Emotionally, it's getting harder and harder to travel as much for my eight-year-old. So that's another reason why this book is special because he really still wants those hugs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a dance that all working families do. You know, I just— I don't think it'll ever be perfect. And I'm I'm not sure that I, you know, have it all figured out. I feel like every day I'm trying to figure it out all over again. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> and there are days when I forget things at school. And, you know, my husband and I will get an email from our teacher. Today you were supposed to bring this form or you were supposed to sign this field trip form. And we're like, oh, okay. We got to get back to the bulletin board in the kitchen so we can remember everything. So I try to keep a sense of humor about it. Otherwise, it'll kind of be overwhelming. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like people listening will think like, oh my gosh, like this glamorous life that you live, right? You're out there, you're on TV all the time and you're around all these celebrities. Like, how do you do it? Like, what's it really like? Like, did you always want to do this? Yeah. Well, what, what would we not expect from what your life has turned out to be? Like, what would people not know? Yeah. You know, well, first of all, Inside Edition, yes, we do do celebrity interviews, but the other half is real news. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've had to cover school shootings, natural disasters, difficult medical stories, you know, where a child's going in for surgery. We do a lot of medical miracle stories. So I'm there with people when they're at the top of the world, top of their game, and also when they're at the lowest of lows. And if anything, it's it's a privilege and an honor to see how people love on each other in hard times. You know, I tell everybody that I covered this Sutherland school shooting. Actually, it was at a church, the Sutherland Springs school shooting outside of San Antonio, Texas, a couple years ago. Incredibly difficult, but I I really observed that these Texans were teaching us how to grieve in the way that they cared for each other. I mean, neighbors were stationed in the driveway of other neighbors who had been affected by the shooting. And they were just talking to people and serving as gatekeepers for the media and saying, hey, they don't want to talk right now. We'll let you know. And I just thought, gosh, the way they were loving on each other and caring for each other was really a lesson in how to grieve and how to love your neighbor. So I felt incredibly honored to just witness that. And it makes me just, you know, want to be a better neighbor myself. And then, I mean, I think— you know, for me, I mean, celebrities are people like like anyone else, and I just try to connect on a human level. Talking about your kids is a great icebreaker, you know, or talking about family or traveling. I mean, I try to just connect with people because at the end of the day, you know, they're humans too. And yes, we see them in glamorous moments, but I've also seen celebrities where their kids are <laughs> asking them for their attention or interrupting something and they're being a mother or a father. And you realize, wow, everybody's really human and we all go through the same thing. So the behind the scenes moments are some of my favorite, which we don't always get to show on TV. You know, it's a quick two minute story, but I'll just end by telling you that something that was really cute that happened was I covered the CMA Awards recently, the Country Music Awards in Nashville. And there were all these celebrities coming down the carpet. You know, you've got Tim McGraw and Carrie Underwood and Maren Morris and all these celebrities. And then I saw in the distance this woman in all black, and she was like, Megan. And I was like, oh, hey. And she's like, I'm Grayson's mom. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm Chase's mom. (laughs) Make a long story short, my son goes to school with her son, and she's a publicist for all these big celebrities. And we just connected on that cute human moment. And I came home to Chase, my son, and I said, guess who I met on the red carpet tonight? And my whole family thought I was going to say like Taylor Swift or something. And I was like, Grayson's mom. (laughs) And he's like, oh, how cool. So it's fun to have those moments. That's, I mean, that was much cooler to my son than any celebrity that I met his friend's mom. So So what's coming next for you? You've done this children's book. You have your first book. More books. What's next? You know, I just talked to one of my fellow songwriters for the song One More, on which this book is based, One More Hug. And we are thinking about putting together a children's album of children's lullabies all originals. We would need to write them, maybe one or two covers. I thought it would be fun to do like one or two Disney songs, just acoustic vocal. But yeah, I'm thinking about a children's album, which would be so fun and sweet and just, you know, putting on those songs as we're tucking our kids into bed, bedtime lullabies. So that's kind of on the horizon. 
Very fun. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Do you have any parting advice? I know you gave some already to aspiring authors. Yeah, the best advice I got was write what you know. This is a story about me and my son and our relationship and his need for one more hug, which I think so many parents and grandparents can relate to and other people too. So if you want to write, write what you know. What's going on in your life right now? What's your season of life? And keep it simple. I mean, this is a very simple book, you know, one more hug. So that would be my advice. Write what you know, keep it simple, and all you need is one yes. So hang on for that one yes. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me, Zibby. No problem. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Thanks so much. Today's episode has been sponsored by Poets and Writers. Visit pw.org to get inspired, connect with other writers, and explore a treasure trove of information about writing contests, literary agents, and more. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You can always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 